My name is Dr. Anthony Fauci, and I'm the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at the National Institutes of Health. And I'm here in my office in Bethesda, Maryland, in the United States, just outside of Washington, D.C. Well, I remember very clearly in the summer of 1981, in June and July, when reports of curiously gay men, first from Los Angeles and then from San Francisco and New York, were reported with a very strange presentation, otherwise well, who were presenting with strange pneumonias and infections. And that was a big mystery at the time until it became very clear that we were dealing with a new disease. We had no idea what it was. It was being given strange names like gay-related immunodeficiency, gay plague, and, and, and inappropriate names like that. So at that time, I decided that we really needed to do something about this. So I began admitting these patients who at the time were all gay men to my hospital here in Bethesda, Maryland to try and study them. And that began for me a 37 year and a half journey of going from a time that we didn't even know what the name of the disease was, much less what caused it, to the time where we now have made major scientific advances to address it. Literally every day we were learning something new. We first thought it was only gay men. Then it became clear that injection drug users were getting infected. Then we thought it was only men, and then women were getting infected, and children born of women who were infected, even though we didn't know what the infective agent was. We inappropriately thought it was a United States disease, and then we became clear that our European colleagues were seeing the same thing. And then we found out that, in fact, the major hub of this was in Sub-Saharan Africa. And this literally occurred almost like in waves of new information until we realized that we were dealing with something that was global. So it became something very frightening that we clearly needed to do something about. As, as the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, it's my responsibility for the design and conduct and funding of outside investigators of much of the infectious disease research that takes place in the United States and even throughout the world because we have an international global program. In that capacity, I have been able to advise five presidents over the years in areas of public health, particularly infectious diseases. And it was in that capacity that I developed a relationship with then President George W. Bush, who was particularly concerned about the lack of access to these life-saving drugs for HIV for people in the developing world. And he called me in to the White House and said, that we, he believes strongly that we have a moral responsibility as a rich nation who now has the accessibility and the availability of these life-saving drugs to make them available to people in the developing world, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa. So over the next several months, with help from some colleagues and White House staff, we put together various versions of a program which after several months of working on it became known as the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. And to our great um, gratification, in January of 2003, President Bush announced the beginning of the PEPFAR program, starting off with $15 billion over five years, which has grown enormously over the last 15 years. So without the kind of very substantial funding, the largesse of taxpayers, not only in the United States, but throughout the world where governments contribute, for example, to the Global Fund, has been really the underlying force that has allowed us to be where we are right now with HIV AIDS. So funding is critical. Will we ever be able to truly eradicate the virus from the body? I think that is going to be a very prodigious task, and I'm not entirely certain we're going to be able to do that. If you're talking about a cure being you no longer have to be on a daily doses of antiretroviral therapy, I think that's more likely. And that could be due to a variety of things. We could intermittently give passive transfer of antibodies that keep the virus suppressed, and you only have to get it administered maybe two or three times a year. We could boost the immune system to see if it could then suppress the virus without needing antiretroviral drugs. That, I think, is more feasible 
than the idea of completely eradicating the virus from the body. We have the tools to essentially turn this epidemic off because we know that when you treat people and you get their virus load to below detectable level, they will not infect anyone else. So theoretically, you could stop the epidemic tomorrow if you did that. Now that's theoretical, not realistic, but I believe we have, as a, uh, as a global community, we have a moral obligation to implement the scientific tools that have taken us so many years to develop. It's within our reach to do that. It's being done successfully better in some places than others, but we need a global effort to do that universally.